Heavenly Father, we thank you for your presence in our midst this morning, Lord God. We ask that as we read your word from Haggai, you would speak to us. May your Holy Spirit speak to every heart and every mind, revealing the glory of Jesus Christ and the way to enter into your presence through what he has done for us upon the cross. I pray that you would be glorified and honoured in everything that I say. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So you've joined us for our final part in the book of Haggai. And in Haggai, the prophet Haggai prophesies four times in this book, which is two chapters long. In chapter one, he prophesied about Jerusalem's sin, namely that they were all building their nice big houses while the house of the Lord was left in ruins. And as he prophesied, God poured out his Holy Spirit upon the people and they were stirred in their hearts to start building God's house once again. The second time Haggai prophesied was at the beginning of chapter 2. The people are discouraged. The temple looks smaller than it was before. But God speaks through Haggai and says, Be strong, work hard, do not fear, for I am with you, God says, and the glory of this latter house will be greater than the former glory. And then, in our passage today, Haggai prophesies, prophesies twice in one day. And we're going to read both these prophecies together. And we're going to see how these prophecies are all about what it means to be unclean, what it means to be unholy and imperfect. And it answers this question, how can people come into God's presence, the holy, holy, holy God? How can people come into the presence of a holy God in spite of the things we do wrong? How can we be used by God in spite of the things that we do wrong? That is what this prophecy is all about. So if you've got a Bible, turn to Haggai chapter 2, and I'm going to read verses 10 to 23. This is what it says. On the 24th day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet. Thus says the Lord of hosts, ask the priests about the law. If someone carries holy meat in the fold of his garment and touches with his fold bread or stew or wine or oil or any kind of food, does it become holy? The priest answered and said, no. Then Haggai said, if someone who is unclean by contact with a dead body touches any of these, does it become unclean? The priest answered and says, it does become unclean. Then Haggai answered and said, so is it with this people. And with this nation before me, declares the Lord. And so with every work of their hands and what they offer there is unclean. Now then, consider from this day onward, before stone was placed upon stone in the temple of the Lord, how did you fare? When one came to a heap of 20 measures, there were but 10. When one came to the wine vat to draw 50 measures, there were but 20. I struck you and all the products of your toil with blight and with mildew and with hail, yet you did not turn to me, declares the Lord. Consider from this day onward, from the 24th day of the ninth month, since the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider, is the seed yet in the barn? Indeed, the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate and the olive tree have yielded nothing. But from this day on, I will bless you. The word of the Lord came a second time to Haggai on the 24th day of the month. Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I'm about to shake the heavens and the earth and to overthrow the throne of kingdoms. I'm about to destroy the strength of the kingdoms of the nations and overthrow the chariots and their riders and the horses and their riders shall go down, every one by the sword of his brother. On that day, declares the Lord of hosts, I will take you, O Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shealtiel, declares the Lord, and make you like a signet ring. For I have chosen you, declares the Lord of hosts. Now, I imagine that thus far in the book of Haggai, it's kind of made a lot of sense. But in that final two prophecies, there are some different imagery imagery that needs explaining. So the first thing I want to talk to you about from that passage is the distinction between being holy, being clean and being unclean. Being holy, being clean or common, and being unclean. God, in verses 11 and 12 in Haggai, asks the priests a question. If someone carries holy meat 
in their robe or in their garment, does the robe then have the power to make other food holy as well? In Leviticus, the Bible commands that when people commit a sin, they would sacrifice an animal as a sin offering to God. And the meat that was offered was considered holy because the lamb that was slaughtered was a ram without blemish, set apart from all the other sheep, which presumably did have blemishes, and set apart in the sense that it was offered to the Lord. Priests would eat the meat that was produced from that sacrifice, and that was how they survived. They ate from the meat of the sacrifice. Now that meat that was offered to the God in a sacrifice to take away sin was considered holy meat, set apart for the purpose of use in the temple. Now the question God asked the priests is, if the priest decided to pick up that meat from the altar and put it in their robe and run around with it for a bit, and then take the meat back out again, and then grab a Kit Kat and put the Kit Kat in their robe, would the Kit Kat become holy? Has the holy meat rubbed off on the garment and then the holiness rubs from the garment onto the Kit Kat to make it holy? That's the question that God asks. He obviously doesn't talk about Kit Kat specifically in the prophecy of Haggai. But that's the question. Does, does the robe make other things holy because it's touched the holy meat? And the answer, of course, is no. To be holy is to be set apart for a very specific purpose. God is holy, 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 which means he's set apart from everything else in creation. All things are created, but God is the creator. He is not created, he's the uncreated one. He has always existed. And so he's set apart from creation. He is something completely different from all things that he has created. There's a line drawn. God, the creator on one side of the line, and all of us and everything in the universe that is created, he is set apart. He is holy, holy, holy. He's set apart in his perfection, in that everything he does is good and right. And that is why he's holy, 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 set apart from anyone and everything else. Objects in Leviticus and the rest of the Old Testament could be holy because they were set apart to be used in the temple for the service of God. Only specific people could touch the holy objects that were used in the temple. Only specific people could clean the objects and they couldn't be used for any, any old thing. You couldn't take them and use them for common purposes. They had to be used in the temple for the worship and adoration of God. So they were holy in that they were set apart from all the other objects that weren't used in the holy place. The priests were holy in the Old Testament because they were set apart from all the other people in Israel to worship the Lord continually. Everybody else farmed land and grew their own food, but the priests were set apart to offer sacrifices on behalf of the people and to receive the food that was brought. And God also speaks to all the Israelites and says, be holy as I am holy. In your life, in your words, in your deeds, be set apart from all the other nations. May your life reflect God's perfection. May you continually be doing God's work. That's what it means to be holy as the Lord is holy, to be perfect and set apart as God is perfect and set apart. So that's a big ask, isn't it? When God says, be holy as I am holy. That's an impossible ask in, in lots and lots of ways. So to be holy is this massive thing in Old Testament culture. It's this wonderful thing to be set apart for the Lord's work, but it's also this impossible thing that people try as hard as they might to do everything perfectly, but they get things wrong. Holiness isn't the sort of thing that is easily transferred. Holiness is not the sort of thing that you can just rub some meat on a gown and then take the gown and rub that on other things and make them holy. No, to be holy is a very special, sacred thing. Now, if you weren't holy... You were common, not set apart, not holy to be used in the temple, but ordinary, common. So you have the holy, holy things, holy people, and you have common, ordinary things and common, ordinary people. You can see why, as the people in Jerusalem, when Haggai was written, are building the temple, 
the question of holiness is a very, very important question for them. Do you see? They're building the building where God is going to dwell. They're building this place where everything that happens there is holy because God is there. They're building the place where all the objects are holy and set apart. They're building the building that the priests would work in and do their holy work. So as they're building this building, can you imagine them turning to one another and saying, are we really holy enough to build this? Can I really place this stone? And maybe some people were saying, hey, do you think this is making me holy? I'm touching the stone that the priest, the high priest will walk on. I'm placing the buildings where the holy objects will be kept. Do you think they were going, am I being made holy because of what we're doing in building the temple? Is it my work in building this temple which is making me holy? So you've got holy and common objects. You've also got things that are unclean. In the Old Testament, if you sinned, or if you touched a dead body, or you touched particular unclean animals, you became unclean. There were specific instructions for how someone who was unclean had to be made clean in order that they could come back amongst the people of God and worship and offer sacrifices in the temple. You had to wash yourself. For for example, if you got leprosy, you had to separate yourself from the people and wash yourself several times and then go and visit the priest and then the priest would declare you clean and then you could enter back into God's people. If you were unclean and you used or touched something that was holy, Leviticus 7 verses 20 to 21 says you'd be cut off from the people. It was totally unacceptable that holy objects could be touched by someone who had sinned and made themselves unclean. It was totally unacceptable that someone who'd been touching dead bodies would come into the temple and eat the holy meat. You'd be cut off from the people. So the goal in life in the Old Testament in some sense, is to be holy, is to be set apart, to be perfect for God, to be participating in God's work. And some people are common, they're able to participate but not be fully involved. They can't come into the holiest places in the temple. And some people are unclean and can't participate at all and have to go through all this rigmarole to become clean in order that they might get close to something that's holy. And that's what this diagram on the screen behind me is all about. I want to ask you this morning, do some of you feel unclean this morning? Sinful? Like you've been separated? Like actually you're nervous, even sitting amongst God's people in the church thinking, I don't belong here. You don't know what I've done this week, Duncan. I feel dirty. I feel unclean. I I feel just totally unable to come amongst God's people. I wonder whether some of you feel common and ordinary not holy and set apart for God's work. But just you think, I can sit amongst God's people, I can come to church, but I can't do anything for the Lord. I'm not, I'm not holy, I'm not set apart to be God's person. Well, I hope as we go through the rest of this passage, you'll be invited and see how Jesus Christ makes us clean and makes us holy. Hopefully there are some of you who know right now that you have been made holy. You have been washed clean by the blood of Jesus. You have been set apart by the power of the Holy Spirit. You are holy in God's sight. And this is what this sermon and Haggai's prophecy is actually all about. In verse 13, God asks another question. If someone is unclean by touching a dead body and picks up that same Kit Kat, does it become unclean? And then the answer is definitely yes. Do you see the distinction? Holiness doesn't spread easily. Holiness is, you know, there's, uh, there's only certain things that are holy and it doesn't spread. But uncleanness spreads. If I go and touch a dead body in Israel in the Old Testament and then I wander around and touch other things, I'm spreading my uncleanness all over the place. Uncleanness spreads everywhere, but holiness is something special and difficult to achieve. I think God's question brings us a warning as Christians. It's easy to fall into sin. It's easy to give in to temptation. You know this in your life. There's been moments where peer pressure has has been forced upon you and you've been surrounded by non-Christians and they've all done something and you've joined in. The uncleanness and sinfulness, in a sense, has spread. 
Maybe online has, things online have tempted you to go to sin and the uncleanness spreads. Or your work culture, you know, lying's okay in your work culture, so you just join in. Or gossip or something else. There's something in culture that brings you into sinfulness. Uncleanness, sin, tends to spread rapidly. But holiness is something that is difficult to attain. As Christians, we need to be aware of sin spreading around us. Jude 23 says, Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others, show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. Do you see that verse? It says, you've got to be saving people. You've got to be snatching them out of the fire. You've got to be showing mercy to people. You've got to be in the world, reaching them, saving them, showing mercy to them. But hate the garment stained by the flesh. Be very wary of those temptations to sin and be wise in where you place yourself, lest sinfulness spread unto you. Well, here in Haggai 2, the people are building the temple and they're asking the question, are we holy now because we're building this holy temple? But God's word comes to them and says, holiness is hard to spread, but uncleanness, sinfulness spreads easily. That's why in verses 16 to 19, God says, even though you're now building the temple, you're still struggling for food in the barn. You're still struggling for olives and wine because just building the temple has not made you holy, has not made you clean. There's still stuff in your life which is unclean and not good. You're, you're, you think that the holiness of the temple is spreading to you, but I'm saying actually what's going on in your lives is not quite right. So verses 10 to 19 raise a really big question. The first prophecy doesn't seem that positive in lots of ways until the very end. How can we be made clean? Haggai asks, or God asks through Haggai. How can we be made holy? And we will return to answer those questions in a bit. For now, and my second point this morning, is that holiness does not come by works. Holiness does not come by works. Works cannot make you holy. What you do cannot make you holy because sin constantly contaminates. Uncleanness spreads, but holiness is difficult to attain. That's the impact of verses 10 to 13. The people think, oh, we were unclean and sinful, but now we've started building the temple. That must make us holy and God's going to bless us. But God says, no, that's not what's going on here. They think our work Our building the temple has made us holy. We weren't building the temple and God was judging us and now we are building the temple, so now we must be holy. Well, if you think that your work can make you holy, your good deeds can make you holy, that is a lie. You cannot make yourself holy by what you do. Jesus says to the Pharisees in Luke 11, verse 39, Now you Pharisees, you cleanse the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. Do you see, the Pharisees think that by what they do, they can make themselves clean and holy. And so their outward deeds are what's really important. But God says, that's like washing up a cereal bowl and washing the outside of the bowl and leaving the mouldy cereal still in the bowl and then come round for dinner, have some food. I've just served the cereal on top of the mouldy cereal that was already there. You wouldn't come round for dinner. And I can see my wife making a face because I'm not very good at washing up. And I sometimes make that mistake. (laughs) That's what Jesus is saying to the Pharisees. You can't be holy by what you do outwardly. You can't make yourself holy. You're cleaning the outside of the bowl and leaving the mess inside the bowl. Maybe you've come here this morning as a non-Christian and you're so welcome. We love having visitors. Maybe you're thinking... I am unclean. I do things wrong. I'm not the person who I want to be. But maybe you're thinking, I just need to be a better person to clean myself up and then everything will be okay. Well, that isn't Christianity. That isn't Christianity. The main message of the church is not come and we'll tell you what to do in order to make yourself a better person. That's not Christianity. That's not Jesus. That's not what we believe. There's far better news than that in the Bible. There's far better news in Christianity than that. The gospel, the good news of Christianity, is that to be made clean, to be made holy, is a work of God that you can receive as a gift, rather than something that you work in order to achieve. 
I'm jumping ahead of myself. We're going to get there soon. The gift of God in grace. But whether you're building the temple, whether you're working really hard in the church, whether you're doing all the good, you're loving everybody in kind, you're still never going to make yourself holy because uncleanness spreads far more quickly than holiness. Crucially, if you are a Christian, one of the great temptations in your life is to think that your holiness and your cleanness does depend on your work. Have you ever felt that temptation? Oh, I've done something wrong, therefore I'm unclean, I'm unholy, I can't come into the presence of God. And that is a lie. If our cleanness and our holiness ultimately is a gift from God, then how can it be in the Christian life that we, we make ourselves unclean and unholy by the things that we do? That's not. If holiness doesn't come by our work, then does unholiness come by our work as a Christian? No. If you've done badly, you say, I can't come into God's presence. I can't pray. I can't do God's work. I'm unclean. I'm unholy. And that's a lie. Because holiness comes from God, not your work. And if your holiness depends on God, not your works, then be confident coming into the presence of God in prayer. Know that he receives you as a holy one, as a child. So the, the second point was holiness does not come from works. But my third point this morning is holiness is a gift of grace. Look at the end of verse 19. I think verse 19 is a really fascinating verse because God says all this stuff that sounds like it's really negative and really hard and really difficult. And then at the end of verse 19, he says, almost kind of out of the blue, but from this day I will bless you. Which is a really surprising thing for him to say. He could have gone, from this day, I'm going to treat you as your deeds deserve. From this day, I'm going to continue. You're going to build the temple for me, but you're still nothing to me. You're dirty and unclean. But instead, in verse 19, just God says, I'm going to bless you. From this day on, I'm going to bless you. And it leaves me with the question of why. Why does it switch? Why does God suddenly go, I'm going to bless you at the end of verse 19? God doesn't say in that verse what the reason is specifically, but it's definitely not because they're doing work and building the temple. Because they've been building the temple for four months by the time we get to this prophecy. So they've done four months of work. Why is it that after four months God says, now I'm going to bless you? Is it because he's trying to teach them that holiness and cleanness does not come from the, the work? If it was about work, he would have started blessing them as soon as they turned and started building the temple. But instead, he waits for four months. So all we can say at this point is God's blessing is what he decides to do. It's his sovereign choice. It's his gracious will. It's his loving kindness. In other words, what we're saying is God's decision to bless us or bless the people in Jerusalem is a gift of grace. And that word grace means unmerited favour unearned blessing and right here in verse 19 God says from now on I'm going to bless you it's not because of the work you're doing it's not because you're perfect because you're not I'm just going to do it because I'm God and I want to bless I'm going to graciously give you something that you do not deserve that's what verse 19 is this injection of the grace of God into the people of God in Jerusalem and then the grace of God continues majestically into verses 20 to 23 my fourth point this morning is really catchy. In verses 20 to 23, God re-elects a line of David from whom would come the saviour of grace, the cleanser of sin and the holy one maker. I told you it's catchy. You're all going to remember that when you go back. God re-elects a line of David from whom would come the saviour of grace, the cleanser of sin, the holy one maker. Let me explain what I mean. When you read one and two kings in the Old Testament, you get good king, bad king, decent king, really evil king, and so on and so forth. You're reading all these stories of these kings and the line of the kings in Israel, and you're finding out that some are good and some are bad and some are really bad and so on and so forth. Let me give you an example. In 2 Kings, verse, 2 Kings 14, verse 3, it says of Joash, who was one of the sort of good kings, it says, he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, yet not like David, his father. So Joash is kind of good, but he's not as good as David is kind of the line that you get about King, uh, King Joash. Then in 2 Kings 22, verse 2, you get a really good king, King Josiah. 
And it says this, he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and walked in all the ways of David, his father. He did not turn to the left or the right. Every time you get a sort of good king, you get a comparison to King David. And so all the way through kings, whether you're getting good kings or bad kings, you're reminded of King David. I wonder whether you've asked yourself why. Why, do, why does he, they keep getting compared to David? Well, the answer is because of something in 2 Samuel 7, verses 12 to 16, which I'm going to read to you. In 2, Sam, in 2 Samuel 7, God speaks to David and he makes David a promise. And this is what he says. When your days are fulfilled, David, and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. But my steadfast love will not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. Now that is first and foremost a promise about King Solomon, who would be David's son and would build a temple. And he's given a promise that his throne will be there forever. And so throughout Jewish history, this becomes a messianic promise. That Solomon was the son of David, and much of that prophecy is about specifically about Solomon, but the throne of Solomon would be established forever, and so there would be a king who is coming, an anointed king, a messianic king, who would reign on David's throne forever. And so throughout the book of Kings, and one or two chronicles, when you're reading these, you're going, is this the guy? Is this the descendant of Solomon who's going to reign forever on the throne? Is he really good? Is he like King David? Is he better than King David? Because he's going to reign forever, which means he must be a righteous king. God wouldn't appoint a king to reign forever who isn't good like him. So he must be a righteous king. So every time you get these little introductions, you're going, all right, he's kind of good, but he's not like King David. Oh, he's really evil. This definitely isn't the guy who's going to reign on Solomon's throne forever. 1 and 2 Kings and 1 and 2 Chronicles are absolutely obsessed with David's line. They're always wanting to trace the line of this messianic promise that there would be a descendant of David who would reign on the throne forever. And these books are obsessed with it. They're desperate for this line to continue so they can follow the promise of God and see where it will ultimately be fulfilled. But then tragedy strikes. The kings get increasingly more and more evil, dreadful, awful people, worshipping other gods, making sacrifices which are not the sacrifices which God ordains. And so God says something absolutely awful to the people in Jeremiah 22. Another prophet, Jeremiah 22. I'm going to read this to you. I promise this is all going to come together in a second. Jeremiah 22, verses 24 to 30. Let me read you this. He's talking about Jeconiah or Caniah, and he says this. He's an evil king. As I live, declares the Lord, though Caniah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, were the signet ring on my right hand, yet I would tear you off and give you into the hand of those who seek your life into the hand of those whom you are afraid, even into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and into the hand of the Chaldeans. I will hurl you and the mother who bore you into another country where you were not born, and there you shall die. But to the land to which they will long to return, they shall never return. Is this man Caniah a despised broken pot, a vessel no one cares for? Why are he and his children hurled and cast into a land that they do not know? O oh, land, 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 hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, write this man down as childless, a man who shall not succeed in his days, for none of his offspring shall succeed in sitting on the throne of David and ruling again in Judah. Do you see why that is a disaster? There's this line of David that's been ruling in Judah for many, many years, and everyone's been waiting for the righteous king who's going to reign forever and sit on the throne forever. And now God says, this guy, this guy who's from the line of David, none of his offspring will sit on the throne. Treat him like he's childless 
because they're going to be taken to Babylon, into Chaldea, and his son, his offspring, will not sit on the throne of Judah. The line is broken. And the metaphor that's used is as if the signet ring, is God takes off the signet ring. The ring, which represents the kingship of Judah, God says, the kings have been my signet ring, a, pro a promise. A ring is a promise. And a signet ring marks the words of God. And God says, I've taken off, I've taken off the signet ring. The line of David is broken. And this man is childless and no one's going to reign on the throne of Judah. And then look at what God says in Jeremiah 23. Keep, I'm just reading on. The chapters aren't in the original Hebrew. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who care for my people, you have scattered my flock and have driven them away, and you have not attended to them. Behold, I will attend to your evil deeds, declares the Lord. So this is the same, this is the same thing. This is the judgment of God. But then... Then I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I've driven them and I will bring them back to their fold and they shall be fruitful and multiply. I will set shepherds over them who will care for them and they shall fear no more nor be dismayed. Neither shall any be missing, declares the Lord. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch. And he shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell securely. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. So Jeconiah will not have a son who sits upon the throne, but God, who is gracious, will raise up a righteous branch of David, one who is truly descended from David, and he will sit on the throne. Now, turn back to Haggai and verse 23, where God says this. On that day, declares the Lord of hosts, I will take you, O Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shealtiel, declares the Lord, and make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord of hosts. God says in Haggai chapter 2, I know that I took the signet ring off my hand in Jeremiah 22. I know that the line of David was broken, but now I'm restoring that which was broken. I'm putting on the signet ring again. And Zerubbabel, you are the signet ring. You are the descendant of David. You are the son of Shealtiel. And you can trace Shealtiel's lineage back to David. The Davidic line is being restored. Zerubbabel, the descendant of David, is reinstated. And when you read the genealogies of Jesus in Matthew and Luke, guess who you find? Mr. Zerubbabel, the signal, the signet ring who God restored in the city of Jerusalem, who was the king who reinstated the line of David. That which has gone wrong, God, by his grace, has made right. And so although it doesn't use his name and it doesn't appear to be messianic, this final prophecy in Haggai is all about Christ. Zerubbabel, you are the promise, you are the signet ring, from your line will come one who will make all of this right. In Zerubbabel's descendant Jesus, all the prophecies in Haggai 2 and Jeremiah 23 and 2 Samuel 7 all come together. Jesus is the righteous branch in Jeremiah 23. He is called the Lord is our righteousness because Christ on the cross took our sin upon himself and gave to us his righteousness. So Jesus really is our righteousness. We stand before God, not in our sin as Christians. But if you put your faith in Jesus, then you stand righteous because you're clothed in the righteousness of Christ. So Jesus really is called the Lord is our righteousness because we stand because of his righteousness given to us. Jesus is the descendant of Zerubbabel and David, who reigns forever as king, the fulfilment of 2 Samuel chapter 7. He reigns over a kingdom that is growing and growing and growing and one day will fill the earth. God will establish the throne of David forever and Jesus Christ, the descendant of Zerubbabel, will sit on it. Jesus is the one through whom God blesses us with grace. He is the saviour of grace so that people like you and me who don't deserve God's blessing, receive it anyway if we trust in Christ because we receive this gift from God. Jesus is the one who washes someone unclean 
so that they are clean. He deals with spreading sinfulness by his death upon the cross and his blood flows from the cross and washes us white as snow. If you are a believer in Christ, your uncleanness has been washed off of you forever and ever, eternally by the blood of Christ. Trust in Christ and his blood spiritually washes away everything you've ever done wrong and everything you will ever do wrong. And if you're a non-Christian, that's the message I want you to hear. Not do works to earn your own cleanness, but trust in Christ and receive forgiveness as a gift from Jesus who has died for you. But Jesus doesn't just make you clean. He also makes you holy. Hebrews 10 verse 10 says, We have been sanctified. We have been sanctified, which means made holy, through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Jesus then is the ultimate holy meat. He gave his flesh upon the cross so that whoever eats of it in a spiritual way, eating of it by faith in him, is made holy. Jesus isn't like the robe that can't make the Kit Kat holy. Jesus is the one who gave his flesh so that whoever believes in him is made holy forever. In other words, if I can have the diagram up again, Jesus cuts across this whole diagram. He takes people who are unclean because they've done things wrong and he makes them clean And he sanctifies them into holiness. His is the sacrifice that is offered in order that everyone who believes in Christ can go on this journey. If you are a Christian, you're not unclean. Jesus has made you clean. And if you are a Christian, you are not unholy. Jesus Christ has set you apart as his. You belong to him. And you are set apart forever, holy, because of what Christ has done. That is why we worship him. That is why we love him. That's why we celebrate the work of Christ upon the cross, because it transforms our existence. And so I want to offer to you, as I draw to a close, three responses. There are some people who feel unclean in this room. If you're a non-Christian and you feel unclean, you feel you've done stuff wrong, I pray that you would right now be yearning for the forgiveness and washing that comes from Jesus Christ. And Jesus says, come to me. Believe in Christ this morning. Believe that his blood flowed so that you would be washed clean of all the things you've done wrong. That's the invitation of God. Come be in the presence of a holy, holy, holy God. Jesus has made a way. And Christian, maybe you feel unclean this morning. Well, just a reminder Just this very important reminder, you have been made clean by the blood of Christ. You are not, if you're a true believer, you are not unclean in the sight of God. You are clothed in the perfect righteousness of Jesus. Well, maybe there are some Christians in the room who feel unholy. You think, yeah, I'm clean, but I'm not holy. Maybe I've been cleansed, but have I really been set apart to enter God's holy place, to be used by God for his glory? You think, I'm just common, I'm just ordinary, but Jesus says to you today, the Bible says to you, God says to you today, yes, Jesus died to make you holy, to set you apart so that you would be his forever, so that you could be used for his glory. You are most welcome to come to the throne of grace with confidence, not because of your works, but because of what Christ has done. You are invited into the holy of holies to have a relationship with the holy, holy, holy God, to even call him father. Please do not. Just sit in the congregation of the church and think, I belong with the people, but not in relationship with God. No, Christ has made you holy. And as a sign, as a seal that he's made you holy, he's poured the Holy Spirit into your heart. You have been made holy by what Christ has done. So come to God, run to him and know that you've been set apart for his glory. You have a purpose in Christ. Like all the holy objects (laughs) in the temple, you have a role to play in the worship and glory of Jesus Christ. Well, finally, a response for all of us is that we should rejoice and thank God for the grace that we have received through Jesus. Our works could not make us holy, but Jesus has. 
Christ, the descendant of Zerubbabel, the restored signet ring. Jesus, the descendant of David, the righteous branch described in Jeremiah 23, the king who will reign forever, has blessed us not because of works, but because of his grace. And therefore we are so thankful and worshipful towards Christ. That's what Haggai chapter 2 is all about. Uncleanness that spreads, the impossibility of being holy, and a promise that through the line of David, through the line of Zerubbabel, one who is coming, who would make a way. Thank you, Jesus, for what you have done for us. Mm -hmm.